Hello and welcome to the Streamlined Connection. Uh, I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino, and I am here this week with my guest Geraldine Thomas of Metropolitan Organizing, and I'm super excited to talk to her in just a minute. But I want to tell you a little bit more about the Streamlined Connection itself um, and why this show came about in the first place. Because it turns out most people don't actually realize that organization is the key to freedom, wealth, and prosperity. It's more of an afterthought or something we'll do later down the road and then they wing it and then they get a little bit overwhelmed. So they don't feel that that overwhelm and stress that they're um, and that lack of time they experience is a result of the disorganization. And being organized, it's not just about being tidy. It's actually a powerful tool that helps you um, make that connection between the control you crave and the freedom you desire. And so you don't give up one for the other, you can have both. It's that tool that helps you arrange your external space that's actually a reflection of your internal space. And when we bring those into alignment by starting with mindset, it helps you scale your business, experience more freedom in your own life, more fulfillment and satisfaction. You have more time, more space, more time for um, the things you really want to be doing instead of the things you feel like you have to do. That's where the overwhelm and the heavy weight of being disorganized comes in. So it's about creating a nurturing and supportive environment where you can thrive and understanding that it starts with mindset and it connects to your emotions and your behaviors is the key to making that easy. So that's about the Streamline Connection. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. I'm a certified professional organizer, actually one of the first in the world. And um, I'm also a many breakthrough business coach. So I've been studying a lot more about how productivity and habits can affect our um, the and, and how it's connected to our money mindset and how all three play a role in how we experience our world. So now that we know about the show, let's find out a little bit about Geraldine, who's the guest today. I have been a member of NAPO with her for many years, and we actually um, did a fun project together, actually two, um, and you may recognize her because she used to be on A&E Hoarders, and she did a couple episodes in my town here in Albuquerque, and we were able to work on that those projects together, and that was really fun. And that's when she started mentoring me in little small ways without maybe even noticing. Um, but I took, today she's going to be talking about presentation skills and how to create a presentation for your small business that allows you to put your voice out there in the world. And part of that, um, she's been doing that for a long time. I actually took one of her workshop classes a long time ago at, at a NAPO conference. For those of you that aren't familiar, NAPO is the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals that we're both a member of and have spent years volunteering for various um, aspects of that. And we both are NAPO instructors. So she also loves to help new up and coming organizers create businesses where they can thrive. But what we both teach on spans organizing into other businesses. So that's super exciting. Um, the one thing she has that I don't have is uh, this specialty in chronic disorganization. It's about mindset and how our brains work in um, affecting our disorder and organization as well. So there's a little bit of overlap there, but she actually got that credential and I, I have not. Um, so without further ado, welcome, Geraldine. I'm so happy to see you today. It's been a while. Thank you for inviting me. I have been looking forward to this for a long time, so it's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I think I actually mentioned the desire to have some sort of podcast or show with you like four or five years ago, maybe, when I first kind of said, yeah, I'll get around to it. So I'm excited that you you agreed to be one of my first guests because, well, thank you. You know, I'm happy to be here. And um, like you say, I think we've partnered on other things. We work well together. So it's a it's a nice yeah. opportunity to spend time with you again, especially post pandemic. Yeah, I know. We haven't seen each other in like 18 months. Um, and we were definitely at least once a year, uh, if not a couple times a year to check in with each other. So welcome. Yes. 
Um, so did I hit all the highlights I was supposed to hit on, on about you today? <laughs> I, think, I think you've done more than enough, I figure. <laughs> if people are really curious with a name like Geraldine, they can easily kind of look me up and figure out what it is that they want from me. So yeah, I'm online yeah. quite a bit. So yes, thank you. Yeah. It's a nice intro. Oh, great. Um, so tell me a little bit about um, this concept of a perfect presentation. <laughs> Well, and I say imperfect presentation. Oh, right. Exactly. Because right? <laughs> we so, are organized, but not perfect. No, and perfect is the enemy of getting something done, right? Yes. A lot of people, like we know, the clients that we work with, um, probably half of them, if I'm just taking a wild guess, have a tendency to want to do something perfectly and it sort of paralyzes them or stops them in their tracks and they never get it done because they never go for just good enough, right? And yeah. we know as organizers, getting it good enough is most of the times much better than perfection. Yeah, and it's it's that it's part of that mindset piece. Like they they haven't yet made that connection between how I think about how something will go affects the outcome as well. Um right. And that it doesn't mean you never procrastinate or you never let something go because you can't do it in a perfect right. way. But it's a, it's more about the actual decision of how you're going to approach it um, that helps. And we procrastinate for different reasons, right? So, yeah. um, and it's really important to kind of learn why and even professional organizers, I mean, I'm happy to spill the beans on myself. I tend to procrastinate when I don't know how to do something. So this is a this is a yeah. uh, lame example, but it's something I think most people can relate to. Uh, I don't know how to do my own taxes, so I have an accountant do it. But if somebody said to me, you're doing your own taxes this year, I would probably keep posting postponing and postponing that until, you know, there was no tomorrow because right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm a percolation procrastinator. So when I don't know how to do something or I can't, I don't have clarity on what I'm doing. I just sit there and it looks like I'm not doing anything, but really I'm percolating. So, <laughs> all right. Like, so we've got to take a break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And after the break, we will be back um, to actually talking about this imperfect presentation with Geraldine Thomas of Metropolitan Organizing. And we'll be right back. The free one minute mail solution works for email too. And you can download it at the link below or over there. Maybe it's a, the link. I'm talking to Geraldine Thomas of Metropolitan Organizing um, about the imperfect presentation and how we... Uh, need to get out there and get our message out in the world as small business owners. So first of all, what is the difference between a presentation and a speech? Is there a difference? There's a difference. And I hear small business owners especially make this mistake all the time. So um, just real quickly, a presentation is much more casual. Usually it involves visual aids of some type. It could mm. be a slide deck, it could be a flip chart, it could be you're holding show and tell, you know, here's a shoe box, here's a how you organize your bookshelves, whatever, here's your financials. Um, it, and there's usually some type of an interactive component during a presentation. Raise your hand if you're in the audience and you can relate to what I'm saying, you know, something like that. Um, and the speaker wants audience uh, participation. Mm -hmm. We want to hear laughter or raise of hands or see each other nudging each, you know, nudging your elbow or your partner. Um, it's more conversational and less formal to do a presentation. Yeah. Now, a speech, on the other hand, is much more formal and ceremonial, and sometimes it can be involved in a ritual. So some people think of churches, synagogues, things like that, having um, more of a speech or presidential speeches. We've all, mm -hmm. you know, those. Um, no audience participation and hardly ever rarely visual aids. So in a nutshell, that's kind of my summary of it anyway. I like that distinction. Um, I also love that presentations are what we're really talking about because it's so key to getting that no like and trust factor when you can have conversations with an audience um, and that interaction. And so it's a great opportunity to teach and 
hold back a little bit something so people want to want to hire you. So what what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I agree 100%. And one of the things I would tell your listeners, especially if they're small business owners or maybe college kids networking or just um, you know anybody really, is think about why you're being brought to that particular demographic. Mm-hmm. That is it your target market? Are you doing a charitable kind of talk where, or are you trying to? I think in our case. People are sometimes in our industry, the home organizing industry, the business organizing, people might be intimidated to work with us. I know mm-hmm. I have had, oh gosh, I don't want you in my house. It's, um, you'll be, you know, flipping out, going crazy with how much stuff I have or how dirty it is or how, you know, I, whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. So hearing a speaker on stage that has a sense of humor and kind of admits her own problems and faults and whatever kind of humanizes them. and it makes i think the speaker more approachable yeah you know um it's funny what you what you said about the the group interaction too like i i was telling you i had a presentation yesterday and at first i was like a little disappointed because i had four or five clients in the room and people I already knew. But then during the presentation, I got to use them as examples. And it allowed me to be less scary to the other people in the room. Like, oh, they worked with her? Oh, okay. So it it can be nice to um, speak in a room that you know a couple of the people or, or you've worked in. So I always look for opportunities to repeat a presentation to the same kind of group so that, you know, there may be opportunity to do that. To normalize people's problems is one of the ways that business people get their foot in the door of, you know, their their targets. So yes, keep that in mind, everybody who's listening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that's another great point. Like, what is the problem your business is solving? I feel like if you know that, you can do a presentation and talk on any aspect of your business as long as you're able to tie it back to your, what problem you solve. Right. And that's part of branding, right? That's yeah. what we're p- putting, what the message is that we're putting out there and put out there what you want to solve for people. So if you're standing up on stage, know before you go, you know, there's a lot to we'll talk about that, I'm sure later, but um, that that's a big part of it. You're correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what do you, do you, Recommend, like I know different audiences need a different length of presentation. Do you have a way to make that easy to adjust for people or some some guidelines on how to make a presentation scalable so that you don't have to do a different one every time you speak? Yes, I am a big, I call them microwave <laughs> presentations. So just <laughs> rewarm, heat it up a little and serve it. So um, the the bones have to be excellent, right? So the structure of your presentation needs to meet the needs of your audience. And this, I hope, will help people who are intimidated to be on stage or on a camera or whatever it is. But um, if you ask yourself, how can I help this person? How can I help these people in the audience? It sort of takes away the, oh my gosh, I'm not perfect. I stutter. I um, say, um, you know, that's a crutch word, a clutch word, whatever. So most people in an audience, you know, they want a few things from you. And one of them is not to be bored. So I tell, especially a new speaker, 20 minute chunks are enough without, and then change the subject. And it depends how long you're being hired to speak or doing it pro bono. But Usually 30 to 45 minutes is a good amount of time and a decent amount of time and then leave time for questions and always prepare because the audience might be really shy and not have questions. And, you know, that's when, again, if you have a sense of humor or whatever your approach is, you say, okay, because nobody has questions, let me tell you some frequently asked questions and then, you know, have things in your mind and take it from there. Exactly. Um, Six minutes max, unless you are really an experienced speaker and then you can go 90 minutes, four hours, whatever you're being hired to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's key to have that framework, that outline of what the sections are going to be. Do you want to go over, um, kind of the, the standard sections of a presentation? 
Well, I think, you know, if we go way back to grade school, it's pretty basic. <laughs> you just have the intro, which is usually something from your heart, something from your, you know, past, an example, a quote, a joke, whatever, mm -hmm. but it's got to be true to you. So that's my starting point body conclusion, lots of little examples stuck in between. Perfect and imperfect. <laughs> um, we got to take another break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino on the Streamlined Connection. We are coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network. And when we come back, we'll go into a little more of the structure of presentations and how to make them memorable if imperfect. Um, we'll be right back. The Streamline Clutter Solution online course will help you gain control of your stuff and space. What are you waiting for? The links are here somewhere. Do you have, is there a kind of a standard format for how the body of a presentation might work in terms of, um, you know, how many points to make, how deep to go, stuff like that? Well, here's a couple things to think about as you're considering. The number one is how much time you're being allowed, because the kiss yeah. of death in our industry would be if you run over, right? Like you oh, will never hear the end of it. <laughs> Attention to detail. You got to be minding your, you know, you have to get people in and out on time. And we're time management supposedly experts. So that would be key. Um, yeah. Another thing is I would say in the body. So if you have one hour, I always tell people scale it back to 15 minutes and, you know, make sure you breathe. We'll, I'm sure, get into some of those techniques a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, the body, give three examples and don't be scared to elaborate a little bit on your personal, like yourself, your clients, people's <coughs> pain points. Um, there's my worker barking in the background. All right. And <laughs> that's Pip. Um, and also, um, I lost my train of thought there with the body. Oh, one of the things I think is kind of a rookie mistake, and we see this a lot when, you know, I'm helping people create presentations is not having a strong ending. And mm -hmm. the, the ending is really, you know, first impressions matter a lot, but wow, how you're ending is really the, the final impression that people will have of you. And it's mm -hmm. usually goes down in the evaluation right as a speaker so you want to make sure you have a nice clear call to action do you want people to visit your website do you want them to sign up for your newsletter do you want them to um you know come up and have their photo taken with you afterwards it, there's a million things that you could ask an audience to do but they have to know what you want them to do yeah, that's a really great point. Um, yeah, so many presentations just kind of end with that fizzle of, okay, I'm done. Or questions? <laughs> no. Okay, well, let's go. To yeah. The you know, like, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's really key. Um, I also really like a recap. So for those of you watching, this show is actually structured as a presentation, and this is how I do my presentations live. I mean, I'm not in conversation, but there's some sections that happen and so pay attention to what this show is and how it's structured and and it'll give you a, a good idea of, of how you can make those transition points between your points and and to wrap it up um so let's talk a little bit do, did you have something to add to that i do actually yeah. um one of the other things exactly like aligning with what you're saying is um people have to know um, I always, for the most part, we're there to do one of three things. We're there to educate mm -hmm. our audience, which is what you're doing. We're there to entertain, which I think you're also doing, or we're there to persuade them. And persuasion can be either serious persuade, like an attorney, you know, guilty, mm -hmm. not guilty, or motivate. So typically yes. you and I are on stage to motivate people. So that's mm -hmm. another thing. Keep in mind, and the mm -hmm. best presentation Patients combine those three things, education, entertainment, and motivation or persuasion. Yeah, great. I find a lot of people also get um, kind of nervous about, you know, writing, like if they're a blogger and they've been writing lots of blogs and then all of a sudden they got to do a presentation, they aren't really sure how to change it to be more effective as a presentation versus just the ideas on a page. Do you have any suggestions about that? Yes. And it all starts with 
let go of perfection because most audiences are not, unless you're specifically billing yourself as a, a National Speaker Association top speaker or a Toastmaster, you know, level whatever, most people aren't there expecting you to be the world's greatest speaker, but they mm -hmm. are expecting you to be passionate about your topic yes. and know what you're talking about, right? So knowledgeable mm -hmm. and passionate. And they will forgive a whole bunch of things that you do, whether you trip on stage, whether your PowerPoint, you know, goes kaput. Um, they're not there looking for perfection, which is another mm -hmm. thing. What can I do to help the audience put it, put it out there? Yeah, I love that. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences with many speakers, lots of summit style conferences, and you'd be surprised how many well-paid professional speakers are actually quite boring because they're just not that passionate about what they're talking about anymore. I don't know if they've overdone that topic or what, but their energy and their um, likability just doesn't come through. And I've seen brand new speakers who've never spoken before give standing ovation talks, even though they made a bunch of mistakes because their personality and their passion came out um, during during their presentation. So don't right. be afraid of what people will think of you either, because what they think of you is actually none of your business, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you don't know if they're actually laughing at you, with you, or about something else they saw in the audience. Um, and so just be be aware that their reaction in the moment isn't necessarily a reflection of how much they actually like you. And if you don't have at least one person that doesn't like you in the audience, you didn't really do your job that well, I feel. You need to take a stand for whatever it is you're talking about. Yeah, practice before you go as well. Practice on friends, practice on people that don't know you extremely well. That's usually a better, you know, are they yawning? Are they looking away? Are they checking their phone? <laughs> I don't know. One of the very first presentations I gave about my business was at one of those home and lifestyle expos at our fairgrounds. And um, I go into the little speaker room on the side and there was all kinds of workshops going on that day. And a bunch of people had parked their old relatives with their oxygen tanks and wheelchairs in the front row of the presentations. <laughs> That's how I'm giving a presentation to all these people that were dozing off. It was not a good reflection of me or the topic. And then all the people that were really interested were in the back row. So it was weird. Um, but <laughs> you don't have control over though, right? I mean, no, you just yeah. got to go with it. So um, I think a little bit of uh, humor and improv is, is nice to have. And I noticed you started the, the segment with yes. And <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't studied comedy people, <laughs> it's worth it. It's, it's good, definitely good. worth it. Okay, so I'm Miriam Martizzi Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And we're talking about how to construct an imperfect presentation with Geraldine Thomas. We'll be back after the break. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. Let's get back to a little bit. What's the difference between writing for the page and writing for the stage? I can't wait to hear what your tips on this are. I know you talked about them in the workshop, but I can't recall off the top of my head. So I'm excited about this. Good. Okay. I love enthusiasm. That's good. Positive feedback. Okay. So for um, there's a couple things to think about, right? If, if you're on a stage, how big is the room? How many seats? Mm -hmm. If you're writing for the page, or again, I'll, I'll jump backwards for a minute. And now we're all used to doing video presentations, right? So how far away, how close to the camera? And we've all seen the people, mm. you know, in the evening news or whatever we're watching where the camera is like at the way wrong angle or the lighting is horrible. So those are a couple things to think about, right? The camera, the mic, the podium, are you at a podium or not? Mm -hmm. um, eye contact, right? So it's really hard to stare into the little camera on a computer so you have to practice that or right. if you're, um you know teleprompter or something like that whereas if you're standing on a stage um and you have free reign to walk around and uh sort of um go from side to the side of the stage you want to make sure that you have eye contact for just a moment with many many people in the audience right and sometimes i will tell people who are nervous speakers 
to find an empty chair if they can, because that's a little bit easier to look at and then look again for an empty chair rather than staring at somebody because they feel sometimes they lock eyes. And I've had people tell come back and tell me like, I tried to find somebody and I just kept staring at them the whole time, which makes the audience very uncomfortable. So those yeah. are things to think about. <laughs> the audience doesn't know you're looking at an empty chair either. It looks like you're looking at someone. Right. And, you know, are you channeling or are you a crazy stalker from the stage? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's also physical energy, right? So if you're on TV, they're going to ask you to really pour on a lot of physical energy because that camera flattens things down. And I think right. it's the same with Zoom, right? Or Skype, yeah. whatever we're using. You know this from coaching your clients. You have to really be extra effervescent because otherwise it just kind of comes across flat. Yeah. Or you're in when you're in person with somebody or on a stage, you have you can take up tons of space, right? And you can do little crazy things with your hands and arms and feet and hips and stand a different way. The energy is very different. So yeah. are you writing for the stage? Are you writing for the page? Um, either either platform you want to make sure that you allow that big thought to drop and have a moment to kind of sit in the air yeah space around stuff just like a good it's organizer just like a <laughs> calendar there's white space yes um your breathing um i've done you caught it a little earlier, uh, lots of improv classes. And the other thing I take every chance I can, at least to a year, are breathing classes. Because when you meet people who are nervous, the energy comes through in their breath, right? And I already have like a really screechy, yucky voice that, you know, is not so beautiful. I'm not, I'm never going to be the voiceover artist of the century. But I know myself, when I hear other speakers, when you're nervous, you kind of take more shallow breaths mm -hmm. and you want to learn to control your breathing and sigh occasionally and take a moment to fill your lungs and all that good stuff. Right. Um, and that has to do, you know, again, people can read. Are you enthusiastic? Are you nervous? Um, dress comfortably. So I've been in scorching hot situations and even on camera or on, on um, video calls. So I will tell women, again, my target market is a lot of women, more women than men. Mm -hmm. And hot flashes happen midlife. So my little tips are for anybody listening, you know, put ice packs under your feet. And if you're at a desk on a video call, occasionally take your shoes off, put your feet they have these little beads that are cooling, so you can do that. Um, there's also bra packs of ice that you can put in there. So nothing is worse than you feel like you're melting and you have to deliver another, uh, you know, 90 minutes or 60 minutes. So things like that. Um, and then the mic pack, things to think about if you're on stage. What are you wearing so that that mic pack can be attached to a bra strap, a neckline, a belt, something like that. Um right hydrating is really important some you know you want to drink warm not cold liquids um tea is good avoid dairy it makes a lot of us have like a frog in our voice myself included if i have uh, dairy free is what i try to do at least 24 hours before i'm going on stage or on camera and then research the room or the platform you're going to be on. So don't, I'm sure you, right? If you're using Skype and you've never used Skype before, Skype with a friend the day before, make sure that you know how to navigate it, Zoom. Um, and on stage, a room looks different when they send you a little picture and you're opening it on your computer screen oh. versus when you're there, right? <laughs> yeah, I did a presentation a couple of years ago where... I'm not really sure why, but the the like projectors were on these two tables kind of near the front of the front row of seats. And you know me, I'm a walker. And they told me it was going to be a bigger room with a, a stage. And so it didn't even occur to me to ask where the projectors were going to be. And I went to start walking and I had to like, I don't have enough room to walk around because I'm walking over cords the whole time. And so that means you have to look down at the cords. So 
even when I'm in person, I try to get there early to walk the room before I go on. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And the minute you break eye contact with your audience is never a great thing, right? You want to feel that no. is the best thing about presenting live is that you're there and you can look at people and see their reactions and all that good stuff. Yeah. And also with your cord remark, you reminded me, you know, if you're not a woman that wears heels, don't decide dressed up and put your heels on that first time because, and again, are you climbing yeah. through stairs? Are, is there a railing? How are you getting off a stage? And what mm -hmm. exit plan from that room? Oh, yeah. I've worn a pencil skirt where I couldn't get up the steps before. <laughs> it was like, whoa, these are very high steps. <laughs> Read that next time. Yeah, exactly. All right. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino with the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network, and we need to take another break. But when we come back, we're going to be talking more about how to bring your brand into your presentation so that you, you know, make it all happen together. Uh, we'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. We're starting to get into some pretty practical stuff. Um, and one of those is branding. I mean, the whole reason we're presenting, right, is to strengthen our brand and get people to hire us or know about us in some way. So how can we bring our branding into the presentation itself? Great question. And I feel like I could do a four hour workshop on this. What? Which I <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to make sure that your audience is leaving with lots of actionable, doable, not impossible things. So first things first, we'll separate the people who are working for a larger company or maybe they're self-employed. And then the third group would be people who just are networking and possibly thinking more about becoming um, more confident, more self-assured, more personal branding stuff. So. Um, the first thing about branding is everybody likes to talk about all the fun, juicy stuff, right? The logo, the colors, the fonts, but what they do, and you and I have both been to presentations where I just like ding, 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 frying pan to the head moment right. is <laughs> they include their images are all over the place. So photography, cartoons, uh, data graph, you know, points of data, Pick one or two and stay consistent. But I get a little cringed out when I'm sitting in the audience and I see, you know, one slide is cartoons, the next is photography of pineapples and beaches and, you know, umbrellas in your drink. And then the next one will be black and white photos like Dorothea Lang style, right? I'm like, okay, there's there's no branding going on here. So right. be mindful. Um, other elements from your company's visual identity. Um, the, the reason all of this is, is so important is because you want to introduce the audience to your brand and make them a little more familiar with your culture, the way you operate, the experience that they should expect when they're working with you, as well mm -hmm. as, you know, the obvious stuff, your logos, your colors, your, you know, your language. So if you're if you're normally charming and friendly and super Southern or whatever your voice tone is, they should expect to hear that on stage. They should expect to see it in your blog post. They should expect to see it in your letter of agreement, all of those things. So be consistent. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that help a little bit? Oh yeah. I love it. Um, and just, you know, looking at our two backgrounds, you guys, this is our offices. This is my audience, my office. Gerilyn has a different, more Southern and formal um, uh, group of ideal clients. And so hers is, is a little more pulled together and formal than mine. Um, and it it's part of our brands. It's what comes through um, in all kinds of areas. And uh, something else to think about is, you know, with all of the Zoom and Skype and video conferencing stuff, we, you and I, don't see clients in our office. I'm in my home. Right now, that's why you hear my little dog barking and all, you know, right. it's life, right? So the thing about the pandemic is it's allowed us a real slice into people's homes. And yeah. for some 
problem. That's a very unfortunate, uncomfortable thing. They they mm -hmm. might not have extra space. They might be working from their bedroom, which is mm -hmm. personal, right? But they don't have options. So um, anyway, back to branding. The reason you want to try to start being a little more mindful about your brand is it elevates the level of professionalism. And mm -hmm. that's that's what most of us want. What So if, even if you're at a networking event, right, you want to project friendliness, approachability, authenticity, but you want to come across professional and being having a stronger brand will help you do that. Yeah. Um, I also think that having a consistent brand experience mm -hmm. is going to distinguish you, me, anyone from mm -hmm. competitors or colleagues. But, you know, you should be able to call one plumbing company, wallpaper company, jewelry seller, professional organizer, and from that person's website, be able to sort of determine what to expect. What we don't want is a horrific surprise on the other end, right? So the person mm. showing and acting and just completely different than what you're seeing or reading on their website. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I can't remember who I was looking up the other day, but they're Photos were, it was off stock photography. And I knew that because I, you know, peruse stock photography regularly, looking for things that are on brand for me. But then I actually knew the person whose website it was. And I was like, none of those pictures have anything to do with that person. Right. And I actually called her and was like, you might want to take a look at, like, when you show up at someone's house, it's not going to be the experience they're getting on your site, you know, clean, crisp, clear. And then you're, you know, you've got blue hair and tattoos and you're great at what you do, but it's not what's on your site. So. And, and I always tell people kind of look at brands that you admire mm -hmm. and try to put words that you can associate. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you, I'm going to share really well-known brands so that everybody yeah. listening can relate. So like Tiffany's, the jewelry company, my words to describe that brand is it's feminine and it's sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? Um, versus something like Red Bull, right? Mm -hmm. Super adventurous, very exciting. Um, if if you want to come across as modern and friendly, maybe start thinking about using organic shapes and more playful colors or more subtle colors. And all of this matters because it is, you know, even teeny tiny children who don't have a great command of the English language yet can ride down the highway with their parents and they can point out McDonald's or, you know, this or that. They they know that logo, those colors are very distinct. Right. So your branding is what is kind of shorthand for who you are, what you stand for and the experience your clients can expect. And the more you are consistent with that, like I love that you mentioned consistency because I think especially now after the pandemic, everything has been so up in the air and so uncertain. Anytime you can help give a sense of certainty um, as the overlaying thing, and that's mostly through consistency, I think you're you're better off these days. It's reassuring to consumers. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. All right, we've got to take one last break I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino on the Streamlined Connection. I'm here talking with Geraldine Thomas of Metropolitan Organizing about the imperfect presentation. And uh, we'll be back right after this break. Get the Streamlined Time Solution online course and learn easy ways to control your time and tasks. Links here somewhere, down there, I think. Let's uh, kind of wrap it up, Geraldine. What what do you think some, some final thoughts, some keys for people to know? Um, that'll help them present. Okay, well, let's do a little no before you go, okay? So these yeah. are words from um, the experienced. <laughs> All right, yeah. so uh, ask if you're going to a venue to speak, ask about the parking. You know, are you parking mm -hmm. the deck? Are you parking in a paid lot? Are you parking three blocks away and have to schlep all of your stuff through the rain and snow or 100 degree heat and humidity? Um, is there security that you have to check through? Um, get the contact info of the person you're supposed to be meeting with when you walk in the door, right? Nothing worse than asking the security guard in a building of 1,000 people, like, do you know so-and-so? Um, where are the least crowded restrooms? That happens to be my favorite question, right? 
<laughs> Will the audience be eating or drinking while you're presenting? That's a that's a mm. huge thing. And now personally, I don't do any presentations if there's eating and drink. I mean, drinking, I don't care, but uh, eating anymore because it's so distracting. Right. Are there stairs up to the stage? I mentioned that a minute ago, you and I discussed. Mm -hmm. um, what are the background colors of the stage? Because you want to wear a color that stands out. You don't want to, if it's royal blue, don't wear royal blue. Mm -hmm. um, is there a good spot to take photos afterwards? Because sometimes people will want to come up and have their photo taken with you or a product or something. So ask the event planner where where that could be done. Um, big, big, big tip is, are there presenters before and after you? And on YouTube, people can look. I have a video which explains why I tell you that that is <laughs> such an important point. Um, and again, know your call to action. How's that? Perfect. I love that. And then speaking of, you know, knowing if someone's on or after you, do you remember that NAPO conference where um, Kelly McGinnis was late? I do not remember that, but okay. Oh, so she was our final keynote speaker. She speaks a lot about the brain and habits and, and sh her plane was late. Oh. And so there was this stall and when she finally arrived, she wasn't that late. I like maybe 15, 20 minutes for a late plane. That's not bad. She jumped on stage, threw a bag on the ground, like jumped up on the stage and started her presentation. And all the organizers were running around like, are you sure you're okay? Don't you need a break? What do you need to do? Like she was so professional. She was just like, I'm here. Let's do this thing. Here's my, you know, and it went off without a hitch. It was great. Oh, that's a good story. Nice. Yeah. So, but I think she knew enough about it to make that happen. Right. So, um, we got to wrap this up today. So let's just talk about it. We've got, you got to get out there and know that it's okay to speak and not be perfect in your presentations, yeah. but it's a key factor in how your community and your ideal clients are going to get to know you. And so whether it's one-on-one -on -one conversations or giant keynote presentations, the same rules and thoughts still apply. You got to be a little bit prepared. You got to know your room. You got to know your audience. You got to know what problem you're solving. And you have to know how you can bring your brand into the presentation to create um, consistency and therefore more certainty that you're the right solution for their problem. So think about that. It's lots of little key points that are super easy and you can make a checklist and Geraldine's even offering a couple of checklists and things on her website which is met now i can't read my tiny font here <laughs> metropolitanorganizing.com yes metropolitanorganizing.com she's got several free offers on there take full advantage because her lists are great i have done several trainings with her and and can't recommend her highly enough for this kind of professional development training stuff, as well as how great she is with organizing. Um, so don't forget to check that out. Also, next time on the show, I have Mike Vardy, the productivityist from uh, Canada. <laughs> so you know he's going to be nice. And um, he's full of great tips as well. Always, you can send any comments, feedback, or questions to Miriam at morethanorganized.net. And be sure to tell all your friends because getting organized is so much more fun when you do it with someone else. And in the meantime, have a delightful day. Again, I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection. And thank you so much, Geraldine, for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.